Well, good morning, Zion Baptist Church. Um, I want to just thank you for this opportunity this morning to reconnect uh, with you and share with you in your worship. Um, my thanks to the worship team. And I also bring you greetings from a little church down in Arnold, which is about half the size of this. It's called Emmanuel Pentecostal. It's an AOG church. And when you go in, it looks a bit like um, not a funeral parlor, what do you call it? Crematorium. It looks a bit like a crematorium. It's just like a big curtain right across the front, and then the piano on the organ. And there's a piano on one side and an organ on the other, and they're played at the same time by two very elderly ladies. One's 94 and one's 81. Right? <laughs> but the lady on the piano who happens to be the pastor's wife she plays it like a pub pianist. Oh, she's, <laughs> she's young. She's she really, she really, she, she really raises the roof. She's <laughs> And when I got Brian's phone call a few weeks ago, it was a real blast from the past. Because we left Zion 13 young years ago. And it was all brand new. Yeah, 39, yeah. 39 years ago. I'm not that old. Yeah. Uh, because we moved down to Nottingham. We were going up and down to Nottingham because I was teaching RE in, uh, in, in a rough, tough old school down there, the highest uh, juvenile delinquency rate in the country. So that was fun. <laughs> anyway, when I was asking the Lord this morning for a word for you, the subject that kept coming to me was the subject of faith. And so, I was done it. <laughs> Who's doing it? Where are we? Oh, Brian, he's hiding over there. Right. And um, I've been looking on your website and, and we've been thrilled to see how Zion has been keeping the faith over all those years and to see the remarkable changes that have taken place, resulting in where you are today. And, and, and you know, it's so different. You know, I can't really put it into words. When I walked through the door and saw the transformation, it's just incredible, really. But, Probably you're very used to it now, aren't you? Yeah. I don't know how long it's been like it, but... Three weeks. Right. Good. Okay. But you've been on a journey of faith. So this morning we're going to look in Romans and chapter 10, where Paul teaches about faith. And uh, the subject is the faith that saves, or saving faith. I'm just going to read verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. And you know, when you find Jesus, when you receive Jesus as, as your Lord and Saviour, there's a natural reaction, a natural response. Uh, that uh, is birthed in you to see those that you love come to faith. It may begin initially with those nearest and dearest to you. Your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your best friend. Family. You want to see them come into the experience of knowing Jesus Christ, which has been your experience. And it's been such a wonderful experience that you can't help but want to share it. I remember when I, I first came to Christ, um, I was down in London and, you know, if there was somebody on the tube that I could talk to about Jesus, I would. And so there was that sort of freshness and that boldness that there very often is in the new convert, right? So we love to share our faith in Jesus with those nearest and dearest to us. We're just like Paul. We have a longing that others will come to follow and trust and believe in Jesus. But then he makes a radical observation. 
uh, which we'll come to in just a moment. He says, as it goes on in, in uh, Romans 10 and verse 2, listen to this. I know what enthusiasm they have for God. This is the Jewish people. But it is misdirected zeal. So you go on to the next one. Right. Misdirected zeal. And verses 3 and 4 should come up. This is what Paul says about his own people, the Jews. He says, they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. And refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. But Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. This is a tremendous statement, isn't it? And as a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Lord, yes. If you believe in Jesus this morning, everything between you and God has been put right. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, moving on though to the next slide, Brian. Millions of people around the world are shut up this morning, this very day, in the prison house of misdirected zeal. And so you can see there's the Jews. The modern Jews, many of them are not even believers. But those that are are still locked up in their own understanding of how to get right with God, which is through the law, through the keeping of the law. You've got all those who are in false religions, and many of them have a great zeal. A real determination to communicate what they believe to others. But it's a misdirected zeal. You've got the current example of the ISIS Muslims. Their zeal is incredible. But we can see the horror and the misery and the fallout from that has already been um, alluded to this morning during our time of worship as they persecute and destroy and slaughter in the name of their God. It's a misdirected zeal. But it's not just in the realm of religion. It goes into the realm of politics as well. Because if we think about what we've celebrated recently when we've been thinking about the Great War and then we've been thinking about the, the Holocaust there was the misdirected zeal of the Nazis. If ever there was a man who was deluded, it was Hitler. And many would argue that our own politically correct establishment is taking our nation down a dark and dangerous road in their zeal to make us all equal. you'll know some of the things that I'm talking about. I'm just looking around to see if there are any children in the room. I don't think there are now. But here's a question. When we're thinking about politics, when we're thinking about people in government at the moment, how long will it be before those who find children attractive sexually, right, are given their right to be different. How long? Not very long ago, a few years ago, there were a group of people who actually connected with some of the leading politicians of the time in order to promote gay and lesbian relationships. Won't surprise me one bit if a day comes when this kind of behavior will be promoted, will be accepted in our society. Now I know that's shocking, but you know, if we were to go back to, was it 1905 when this church was, was established, it's up on the front, 1905, bring back into the church the people who were worshiping in that day, they would be appalled at the changes that have taken place. 
the things that are accepted now, the word accepted now. But back to Paul and the faith that saves. So 2,000 more years ago, Paul was reaching out to people who were enthusiastic about God. They were really serious about God. Today, we're reaching out to a population with attitudes that range from hardline opposition to the occult, paganism, and every other shade in between. Only a few days ago, I was looking at the news on my little tablet. I haven't got an Apple one. I've just got Nexus. But it's good. And that pops this piece of news about a Wiccan funeral. I don't know if any of you saw it. This guy who set himself up as some kind of a leader um, in, in, uh, in paganism. He used to be a builder, but he moved down to Devon, or more down that way, and set himself up as a priest, as a pagan priest. And he died just recently, and his funeral was featured on the BBC, with all these pictures of them wearing antler horns and goodness knows what. A, a casket made out of wicker with all these pagan objects on top. It's accepted in our society. In fact, people think it's good. So the kind of people that we're reaching out to, they're not easy to reach. But salvation is for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. It's open to everyone. The message, and it's been shared already this morning during our time of worship, of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ is open to everyone. All a person has to do is believe the message and confess it. Right? The message is, as we've said, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Messiah, was born into this world, crucified in our place for our wrongdoing, was raised from the dead to reign from heaven where he is at this moment in time. And anyone from any background, it doesn't matter what the background is, Anyone can be saved. They simply need to believe that message about Jesus Christ and confess it. In other words, you have to speak it out. Right? You have to acknowledge it before others. That Jesus is your Lord, that you have recognized him as Lord, as the Son of God, as your Savior, as the one who died for you, as the one that you have received into your life. And then you're saved. You've got some baptism coming up for you. On the 28th of June, six people being baptized. What they will do as they go through the waters of baptism is publicly acknowledge that they have believed this message, the good news about Jesus Christ and received him as their Lord and their Saviour. When I was writing my notes, an old song came to mind. You probably know it. I won't sing it to you because you probably run for the door. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. And I believe that he's here now, standing in our midst. And I can't remember the rest of it. With the power to heal yeah. and the grace to, to forgive. forgive. Yeah. Right. With the power to heal and the grace to forgive. Brilliant. That song is a confession of faith, isn't it? Yeah. I believe in Jesus. Right? Let's we'll sing the rest of it. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Who you are, where you've been, what you've done, where you've come from, what your colour is, what your race is, what your religious background is. If you believe the message of Jesus Christ, 
then you can be saved. Believe it and confess it. So we began, didn't we, by looking at Paul's longing for his fellow Jews. What's happened since that time? Well, today you will know that across Israel there are numerous small groups of Jews worshipping Jesus. Messianic Jews. We had a visitor to our little fellowship about a year ago who was in contact with some of these groups and they are multiplying rapidly in Israel. More and more Jews recognizing Jesus as Messiah and confessing him as Lord. There's a little man in our church called uh, Keith Monument. And the first thing he says when you see him on a Sunday morning is, Glory to God forever. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jews are coming to faith in Christ. A recent Bible Society report said that demands for the Bible in some of the countries of North Africa where the so-called Arab Spring took place, is increasing and increasing and increasing. And more and more Muslims in those countries are asking about Jesus. Asking about him. Glory to God. Glory to God. For everyone, it says in verse 13 of Romans 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will Praise his name. But I want us to move on because at this point in the chapter, verses 14 through to 17, we won't read them, Paul raises some pretty important issues. Okay? Critical issues, I've called them. There's that statement I just read to you. But you won't call for help, says Paul, Paul, from someone you don't believe in. And you can't believe in someone you've never heard of. And then he says, someone has to tell you. Because only then can people make their choice. Only then can people respond. Not everyone will accept the message. Paul makes that clear in the chapter as well. Not everyone will believe. In fact, the Bible teaches us that to genuinely confess that Jesus is Lord, we have to have received him and the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Only those who have the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, can truly confess him as Lord. So how do you get this faith? How, is it, how do you actually get it? Well, think about it. How did you come to believe? Someone told you about Jesus. Do you want to move on to the next slide? Someone, maybe many individuals, told you the old, old story. They told you the gospel. They told you the good news about Jesus. You and I heard the gospel message and faith came. Paul states quite simply, faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. Faith comes from hearing. It's a supernatural activity. As we listened, something changed. Faith was imparted to us as a gift. From God. Now I've lost my place because I don't know the pages of God. Right. Faith was imparted. Where's page five? There it is. That's it. Okay. Sorry about that. There was a reaction and a response within us. And the Bible says that this faith is a grace gift from God. Ephesians 2 verse 8. A supernatural 
activity took place as you listened to the message. Saving faith is faith in Jesus. As we've seen, this is important. Listen to this. Faith has to have the right objective. Faith has to be focused on the right subject. It's Jesus who saves, not your faith. Only faith in Jesus is saving faith. You with me? You see, the Muslims have faith, but it's not saving faith because it doesn't have Jesus as its objective. Yeah? The Buddhists have faith, but it's not saving faith because it's not faith in Jesus. Only faith in Jesus is saving faith. Someone said to a preacher once, I wish I had your faith. I really want to believe. How can I get a faith like yours? And the preacher answered wisely, just keep on listening. Just keep on listening. Think about it. Faith comes through hearing. What's hearing? Listening. So for people to come to faith, what I'm saying this morning, for people to come to faith, they have to have the, the opportunity to hear the message, to listen to the message. Now that's both encouraging and challenging. We move on. We have to keep getting the message out there, right? And God will do what he alone can do through the, through the operation of his Holy Spirit. As they hear the message, some, not all, but some, will believe. Okay. So you're getting the message out there. Okay? Now, it's not just encouraging them. It's also challenging. Right? And up there you'll see that I've got a whole list of competing voices. A whole list of messages are out there. All competing for the attention of people, aren't they? All those things that you see up on the screen. The music scene, the games scene. You look at the young people with the games. What is it? Grand Theft Auto? I don't know how many millions of pounds that one game makes for the people who produced it. Millions. Right? You've got TV. You've got film. You've got the fashion scene. Look at the, the way uh, the younger generation are into fashion. Not just the younger generation. You've got the sporting scene. I don't know. Who won, who won the FA Pass? Oh, yeah. You've got clubbing, you've got the drug culture. All these things are trying to grab the attention of the people who live all around us. All right? So today, the majority of people in our communities are unchurched, especially the younger generation. They've no real understanding of the Christian faith. And the possibility is that they will never hear the authentic Christian message because so many voices, other voices, are drowning it out. However, we do have many ways in which to share the good news. There are books, films, tracts, acts, Canada Ball, right? had them not too long ago, didn't you? Texting, the internet, TV, radio, holiday, holiday clubs, youth clubs, women's groups, men's groups, the Alpha Course, Bible Weeks, open air preaching. They are, Brian, you can get down there on your box. <laughs> Regular and special church services, and crucially, your own personal testimony. That's very powerful. 
And you know, when I looked on your website, I was greatly encouraged to see the various ways in which you are reaching out. Just look at what you're doing. And I don't think I've got everything up there. Reaching out to, to build those bridges between the church and your community. The Wednesday Club, the Food Bank, the Quiz Pine Peas Man, Shore Star, Junior Church, the Puppet Theatre. All these different things that you're doing to draw people in, to build relationships with them, to build friendship with them, so that you earn the right to share the message. Yeah? yeah. yeah? So, clearly, you've got some very hard working and dedicated disciples of Jesus in this fellowship. Praise the Lord. A little while back, we moved from a church of around 350. That was Riverside. Now, you have some people from Riverside, don't you? Do you go to the one in it? Yeah. Oh, I thought you might. Yeah. Right. To this little area of fellowship where we live. And last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. And we sang a hymn that I had never sung ever in more than 50 years in the faith. The hymn was called The Comforter Has Come. The Comforter Has Come. And I'm sure that you'll know that the Comforter is one of the titles of God the Holy Spirit. Those are the words of the chorus. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round wherever man is found. The Comforter has come. Friends, you have the Comforter. You have the Holy Spirit working in you and through you for the kingdom of God. <coughs> right at the very beginning of this service, one of your um, folks stepped forward with a little word about being the aroma of Christ. How come you could be the aroma of Christ? Only because the comforter come. Only because the Spirit of Christ, if you have put your trust in Him, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is living in you. Working through you for the Kingdom of God. And His power is immense. Uh, I loved it when we sang that thing about the rain. One of the things that's been on my heart for a long, long time, and I'm sure on yours as well, is revival rain. Revival isn't an easy thing, it's a costly thing. And I'm not going to speak about that now. But you have the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and He is powerful. His purpose is to make Christ known. And He is your secret ally in the world. Nothing can, can ultimately defeat you if you operate in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. All of the isms around you, even though they appear to be very powerful, will ultimately fail when they come face to face, when they come up against the power of the Spirit of God, working in and through you, His church and His people, the body of Christ. So no matter what the opposition is, no matter how difficult it is to get the message out, we have to continue in our efforts to do so. 
and publish the gospel message by every means possible. No one is beyond the reach of God. Uh, Jim was watching a TV program the other day and it was about a woman called Madeline Murray O'Hare. Madeline Murray O'Hare was the founder of the Atheistic Society in America. She was the woman who was responsible for removing prayer and worship from all schools in America. And she built up a multi-million pound organisation. One of her sons became a Christian. He's now a minister. When she heard about it, she completely disowned him. She described the experience for her as a postnatal abortion. As far as she was concerned, he was dead. What that story demonstrates is the power of God. That lad was raised in that environment of atheism, where everything that you and I believe in was totally rubbish and mocked. And yet, through the power of the gospel, through the message of the gospel, that young man was saved, radically saved. He went on and continues to be a servant of Christ. And so I finish. More than ever, we need to get that message out there by whatever means are available to us. More than ever, our contemporaries need to hear the message that there is a way out of prison. There's a way out of the house of sin. A lot of people out there give you the impression that everything is wonderful. Everything's great. Everything's hunky-dory. Believe me, when you, when you go deeper, you'll find that it isn't. You'll find that they're trapped. You'll find that they're broken. You'll find that they're hurting. You'll find that they're in pain. You'll find that because of their, their sin life, their self-life, they're full of shame and guilt. And we have the answer. Jesus is the answer. So go on sharing the message of the Lord Jesus Christ and go on confessing him as your Lord and your Saviour. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Brian, who is in charge? Coming up here. Derek. Thank you very much for the an encouraging word, and there is tea and coffee now being served. Thank you very much. Thank you.